you know, it's great to be competitive and a go-getter and have a lot of grit and determination, but you also have to balance that out with the ability to sort of just be like mindful and present with things and not let your competitive nature overwhelm you with, you know, all the things. Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best and most inspiring minds in the sport. So together, we can train a smarter, healthier, and faster running community. Now, here's your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir. Thank you for joining me for the latest episode of the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast. Last week, I talked to fitness guru Ben Greenfield, which was very exciting and he had some fascinating insights for us all. He's also a great friend of my guest today. So we're following along with this theme of becoming the best version of ourselves and finding that balance. So today my guest is Tawny Prezak. She is the owner and show host of popular podcast Endurance Planet. She's one of the most requested guests for the show, so I know you're going to love it. And she's one of the leading experts in the field of endurance sports. She is a coach, consultant, freelance writer, speaker, fitness model and healthy chef. Oh, and... Of course, she's a top-ranked amateur triathlete as well, (laughs) and I thought I was busy. I'm not sure I have enough hours in the day to ask her all about her accomplishments, but let's see what we find. If you're looking for another companion for your running, Tawny may be just what you're looking for. But before we get to meet Tawny, let's take a moment to thank our sponsors. Running with music or podcasts distract us when those mental demons are loud but not when you're tangled in cords. Jabra Pulse is a wireless sports earbud that is perfect for runners of all levels and speed. Visit jabra.com forward slash runners connect to enter to win a free Jabra Pulse every month. Welcome to the Runs of the Top podcast, Tawny. Hi, Tina. It's great to be with you. It's great to have you on here. And uh, I'm just going to dive right in with uh, some of your accomplishments. Uh, I talked about some of them in the intro. Um, But the first thing that comes to my mind when I think about you is how the heck you fit it all in um do you even sleep because I can't even imagine how you get it so how do you find the balance with all the things that you kind of fit into your life well I've kind of hacked my sleep so I pretty much sleep two hours a night every single night I'm just kidding I'm totally kidding (laughs) um you know as I was telling you before we started recording it hasn't always been pretty behind the scenes and uh but as things have grown and as I've found my niche and passion for everything that I do with the podcast and coaching and all that. I've really had to step up my game in becoming even more organized than I am by nature, which, you know, I'm already pretty type A um, kind of a perfectionist person. But in order to make this all work, you really have to set in uh, processes that just allow for the organization and prioritization of things. Um, and so, yeah, sleep is absolutely of all those things. Number one on my list. Oh, I good. do not, I do not do well on, uh, you know, a lot of people this day and age you're talking about or hearing more about like hacking your sleep and guys needing three to five hours a night. And I, Oh, that just would kill me. In mm-hmm. fact, I had a couple of those nights over the holidays where family kind of tweaked my arm to stay up late and honestly it affects me as much as if you know I have a hangover or something Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so I I'm pretty good at sleeping a solid eight to nine hours a night but you know it's funny it wasn't always like that when I was still kind of in the beginning stages of building my businesses and still wrapping up grad school and getting my master's degree in uh, kinesiology and physiology and all that kind of stuff I was living a life uh, I, I was, my mindset was more based on this idea that I had to be busy. And this has been a really kind of interesting thing that I, a process that I've gone through mentally as I've evolved and I've seen the direct benefit in my sleep. So early on, I would always just feel like I needed to be busy, be defined as busy if I wanted to su- have success. And that's sort of, I think what we are taught in mm-hmm. this modern world that we live in, especially in the United States, is kind of that like, go big or go home attitude. And I totally bought into that. I was like, I have to be busy. All my friends need to think I'm busy all the time. The busier, the better, da, da, da. But if what that was really doing, it was creating a mind that just couldn't rest. And that included my sleep. And so I was having these bouts of insomnia where I'd wake up at, you know, all hours of the night, just being like, oh my gosh, I have to do all this stuff. I got that to do tomorrow, da, da, da. And, you know, on one hand, I was like, this busyness is validating that I'm actually getting somewhere in life. Meanwhile, you know, my other friends who are being lazy or (laughs) 
whatever, and I'm busy, so I'm better. But it was not doing me well in terms of my health and my sleep was suffering. So as I've evolved, I've really had to let go of that notion. And it's funny, I see a lot of my colleagues in this space doing the same. Um, of course, you have to have a lot, you know, you have to have your shiznit together, if you will, uh, in order to be productive and get things done. But it doesn't have to be about being busy. And once you kind of let go of that and let your mind relax a little bit, then heck yeah, you can sleep like a baby. And I really, once I've made that shift in my head, it allowed me to just, once I hit the pillow, lights out, go to sleep, sleep soundly for eight to nine hours a night. And honestly, it's very rare that I wake up in the middle of the night having some sort of like, oh my gosh, what do I need to do next? So it's been a journey. That's kind of scary for you telling me that. And, you know, I shouldn't really admit this live on a podcast, but oh, you I admit everything. <laughs> I feel like you are, you just described me and it kind of scares me because that's exactly what I've been doing. I, you know, a lot of our listeners know that I've gone to see a sleep therapist because, like mm-hmm. you just said, the insomnia, I get up every hour of the night thinking, oh, you know, it's, I, I've kind of, uh recently associated as soon as my head hits the pillow that's where my mind turns on so um yeah, that's, that's a definitely. that's a good wake up call for me so but i'm sure i'm not the only one so how Absolutely. did you find that time to relax and just learn to switch your mind off was there something that kind of was uh more important in that process than other things well again i think you know early on when i was really really heavy into trap on competition uh building a business going to school all these kinds of things all at the same time it was i felt like i always had to be turned on and i always had to be kind of ready in this like flight or fight mode at any given second you know maybe i can even imagine how this might be in like the military or something where they pull you out of bed in the middle of the night and say you guys got to go um and so i had to start to say like well that's great to be like that when i have to be But I have to learn how to turn my mind off in order to allow for this rest because I just knew that I wasn't operating ideally and optimally at that. And it actually kind of took to a point, and I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit more if you want, because I'm definitely willing to go anywhere with my journey. But (laughs) um, it kind of took to the point where I was starting to break down and seeing not just results and like performance suffer in my racing, but in life, you know, I was... A emotional roller coaster to some degree. And I was able, to, I'm, I'm very professional at what I do. So I can always kind of suck it up. Like if I have a podcast or a client to talk to or a client to meet with in the gym, um, I can always suck it up and be present in that. However, like behind the scenes, it would be like, oh my gosh, I'm like way too erratic in my behavior mm-hmm. right now. And something <clears throat> has to change here. And for me, when I started to see like performance kind of going down the drain in my racing, that's when I was like, okay, this is just like too far. You know, meanwhile, health is kind of um, suffering as well. So then you just really, you say like, look, I have no choice but to calm down and figure out a way to just allow sleep, for example, to become like my new goal on like how I can get the best possible night's rest. And I would do things like, uh, you know, disconnecting by allowing myself to read books for pleasure. And it's it's sometimes difficult because I like to, uh, I work from home and I'm in charge of my own stuff so I could technically work around the clock if I wanted to. But having little things, like I would do my foam rolling at night, I wear blue blockers, which, you know, they block out the blue lights so your body is able to produce mel- more melatonin. But it also has become sort of this thing like, a conditioning response, like you think of Pavlov's dogs, or when I when I put those glasses on, I think it now sends a signal to my brain saying like, all right, it's time to chill and relax. And I also make sure um, that my room, my, our bedroom is very simple, dark and cool temperature. And all those things actually really help to promote quality sleep. Mm-hmm. No, that's great advice there. And um, each of those, you know, I have heard of, and I think they're going to be very beneficial if someone hasn't listening hasn't checked out those glasses I think they they definitely help a lot um and I actually do have a pair and um I found that the best thing that works for me is that uh, an hour before I go to bed I literally have no lights on no Mm -hmm. tv on no blue light or phone or anything other than uh one small reading lamp and just to either read or I've kind of been enjoying coloring uh with those adult coloring books or things like that so there are other ways to do it, but that's good to hear that, you know, you, you realize this and you've kind of seen that you don't have to be, uh, like you said, busy all the time in order to be successful. 
Yeah, something else that goes along with that I should mention too is this idea, and I think it also goes along with how we're uh, conditioned in this modern world in the United States and whatnot, um, is multitasking. Mm -hmm. And I think it can be a great thing when you can multitask. Like, for example, right now I'm at my standing desk and I'm doing some stretches and movements to keep my body like moving in that sense. Um, like kind of a virgin version of the couch stretch with a chair behind me. Uh, but at the same time, this multitasking behavior can get us into a lot of trouble because we're not present at what we should be present yeah. doing. And so th for me, again, it learned, I had to learn how to shut down this idea that I always had to be like doing 10 things at once. So if sleep was like the top of the list, then it's time to focus on sleep, you know, mm -hmm. and put the other stuff away. So then here's a question. How did you not, um, as you know, a, like you said, a type A personality, someone who wants to give their best, how did you, how do you not get into the mindset of like, okay, well, um, if they, you know, these experts say, uh, I need eight to nine hours a night. How do you not get into the mindset of, well, then I'm going to be the best damn sleeper there is. And then you get <laughs> into that stage of like, oh, I'm not asleep yet. Well, I need to be asleep yet. Cause I, you know, have to get up or, I have to, you know, pick up my kids in the morning or whatever it may be. How did you not kind of put more pressure on it to, to sleep? I think if I'm understanding correctly, like the biggest thing is just uh, making mistakes and then learning from those. Mm -hmm. So again, like I know that if um, I let myself get too wrapped up in an obsession over whether it's the having being the best sleeper or the best triathlete or whatever it is, um, I have to make mistakes by sometimes doing things poorly and then learning for myself and then coming back and coming full circle with it. And mm -hmm. I see this a lot with my athletes that I coach as well. You know, I'll recommend things and they, I, I know they trust me, but sometimes they still make mistakes and then we, uh, you know, we'll come full circle and have the conversation and be like, you know what, you were right, but I kind of had to learn it for yeah. myself. And I'm yeah. like, absolutely. Like, I totally agree. And I'm not like upset about that whatsoever. Definitely, definitely. And um, so then let's talk about your own triathlon career, which you said, you know, was where you really started to notice that, uh, you know, you weren't giving as much um, energy to it as you should have been because you were focused on other things. Um, but clearly, you're a naturally uh, gifted athlete. Uh, for Thank our you. listeners, you finished on the podium in your first ever race, but you've competed in distances all the way from sprint tries to an ultra to an Ironman but how did you prepare your body for the, you know that big of a range especially with like three different sports I think it was actually really easy because I just was so in love with it and so passionate about it I've been an athlete my whole life you know and I've, I've been more um, on the recreational side of things than your you know a high school athlete who played 20 different sports all year round although I did play volleyball year round for my four years in high school um, so I kind of interestingly come from more of like a power sport like that. But uh, I found that my real genetic potential is definitely in endurance sports. And once I got a taste of a little bit of that running uh, combined with competition, because up into that first race that you mentioned where I actually did get on the podium at the point, I was like, what is a podium? I don't even know what this <laughs> means. Um I'd only been running recreationally and whatnot. And so that first race, I, I've, I felt something that I hadn't ever really experienced before. Because I think even when I played volleyball, as, you know, being a team sport, I just wasn't quite comfortable in my skin and with myself yet to really just sort of like let it all out on the court. And then something about endurance sports, I just found that ability to really just be myself and I, something clicked. And so that first race, uh, that it was a running race. It was a 10 K trail race. Again, it was completely foreign to me, but just completely invigorating. And then I followed that up not too long after with my first ever triathlon. And I will never forget that day. I've blogged about it. I think I blogged about it, uh, within the last couple of years, just, it was such a memorable, memorable day in 2007. It was a sprint triathlon. I didn't do anything incredible, but it, you would think I won the lottery or won the <laughs> Ironman world championships with how much it impacted me. And I just knew that in some way, shape or form, my, the rest of my life was going to be centered around this environment. Mm -hmm. And it, so far it has. So let's hope that uh, continues to be the case. So when it comes to then doing those other distances, it just felt right. It just felt natural. It was my lifestyle and it meant everything to me mm -hmm. and so still you, does. So you've just kind of, like, you, you know, like we are always told to follow your heart and kind of trusted what, what seemed right to you at the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And 
um, you know, that's it, that was a hard thing too. So like at the time that I was starting to compete, I was going to college for a degree in journalism and really kind of was like expecting my career to go into newspapers or magazines or something and not even necessarily related to sport. And I started working for a newspaper that was a local, uh, just, you know, whatever in this little town, just, you know, covering local news and whatnot. Um, and it was a tough decision on one level to give up the idea of a comfortable paycheck and like a steady progression in a quote unquote real career. Mm -hmm. But it's where I kind of just got this spark in me, that competitive nature and that kind of um, I don't care. I'm going to you know, make something of myself based on what I want to do with my life. And I pulled the plug on that and went for it, making a career out of my passion. Yeah. And it was risky for a young girl in her early 20s to do that. But you know what? It was I never looked back and I never doubted that decision and thankfully had the support of people around me encouraging me the whole time. Yeah. And you've been very successful, but it just kind of shows that, you know, the, the risk uh, the big risks lead to big rewards and you're, you know, proof of that, which is, which is great to see. Very, very much. And, you know, it's funny too, because that's where like those times when I did have those bouts of insomnia was around that time. So I didn't go into all that with the world's like greatest confidence. Mm -hmm. I was definitely scared and it probably manifested in nights where I would be up when I probably shouldn't have. Yeah. Um, but as things come full circle and you get more comfortable with it and understand that you're going to survive and it's okay. Um, then everything else kind of comes together too. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And then with the training itself within, you know, training for those different events and, you know, we mentioned following your heart and just training uh, and doing whatever felt right. Um, how did you feel uh, about, you know, the Ironman training when you did go to do one of those? I mean, I've heard a lot about how it can take up so much time that it's hard to fit anything else into your life. But how did you not allow it to become an obsession of yours, knowing the kind oh, of person you are? <laughs> it was an obsession. I'm it not going to lie. Like, it was a complete <laughs> obsession. <laughs> it was actually the year I did my first Ironman was also the year I met my now fiancé. And so he kind of came into my world at a point where I was training with uh, the owner of the gym where I work. I, and the owner of my gym was like a 40 something year old male or no, I guess I should give him some credit. He was actually still in his thirties at that point. <laughs> um, so I have this training partner who's the same age as my fiance. So it's like this kind of like could be awkward situation, but it really wasn't because everyone kind of understood what was going on. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it was just, I was all in at that point, you know, iron doing an Ironman meant everything to me. And I have to say, that's not to say that I did it correctly. And looking back, I would probably take the advice of something, uh, you know, we recently had an expert on our show endurance planet, Joe Friel talking about the buildup to really doing well at the Ironman distance and how it not is necessarily just you know, pull the trigger and six months later, you're on the toe in the line doing an Ironman, you know, it could be a three year process to really mm -hmm. build up that aerobic base and whatnot. And so at the time, my heart was all in, there's no doubt about that, my commitment to put in the hours, um, the blood, sweat and tears sort of thing, you know, um, I was willing to do all that above and beyond and just, just make it my life. However, I don't think I necessarily gave myself adequate time uh, to build up the correct aerobic base and whatnot. And I know for sure, looking back, my running miles, for example, were definitely not what they should have been, nor was my aerobic base. I was trying to keep up with my training partner. So I often ended up running way too hard and yeah. not enough distance. So, you know, I definitely made mistakes. And I think those mistakes have taught me so much now in my own coaching when I get new people to the Ironman distance or even, you know, people evolving into multiple Ironmans. Um, they really get excited too. And they just want to have it all at once. And I really have to reel them in and be like, look, this is a process if you want to do it right and really develop your skill there. And so I went all in and I got through fine. And I think a lot of that is because I am just, I have a lot of grit and I won't give up easily. I really, really do not give up easily. Um, but yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm kind of, I'm kind of rambling. <laughs> no, 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 this is interesting to hear. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that probably made you a better coach then because you were able to look back when, and recognize when people are in that situation, people that you're coaching. Yeah, it's funny. I was uh, I'm about to record the 200th episode of one of our popular shows on Endurance Planet. Ask oh, the coaches congrats. with um, thanks um, with my co-host Lucho and Lucho and I are seriously best friends to this point. 
And he said something during that first podcast that stuck with me just now as I've been kind of going through my day to day on how many mistakes he's made. And this is one of the things people love about Lucho so much is that Lucho is a professional triathlete, you know, a very accomplished ultra runner as well, won the Leadman series. And he's more than willing to talk about all the mistakes he made. Mm -hmm. And I love that because I know Lucho having had him as my coach for so long as well, it makes him a phenomenal coach. And as I start to, you know, again, kind of build my career with uh, in coaching and all that, I'm realizing that those mistakes I made before, you know, they probably used to make me nervous because maybe people would, oh, what would they think? Yeah. But now I'm like, man, that stuff, I really am good at what I do now because I've been there. I've done those things. I've recognized them in the behavior and the physical number. Like the, when I'm looking at training peaks, like the numbers that I see from people and whatnot, I can call them out on things. Like, and it's really interesting. I'm so glad that I didn't just you know, read a book or go to a weekend class to become a coach, but I've been out there doing all the gritty stuff and making a crap ton of mistakes Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, to get me where I'm at now. And it's, it's cool. It's really fun, actually. Mm -hmm. And will you share like maybe a few of those mistakes or the down moments with us just to kind of show everyone that you, you are not a superhuman here? (laughs) Well, you know, again, I think there is a level of genetic talent that I had that got me really far for a long time. I will not deny that. I think my body is definitely geared toward endurance exercise more than, you know, power sports and whatnot. However, I think I also wanted to have the result before or I was trying to rush results. And um, someone else that came into my life also thinks to Lucho was Dr. Phil Maffetone. Oh, and yeah. if you guys have heard of Phil Maftone, he works a lot with triathletes, but definitely not just triathletes, a lot of running stuff too. And um, his big thing is working at your max aerobic function and this like, concept of slowing down to get fast. And if you had told me this in 2010, 2011, I would have laughed and, you know, went off on my tempo run and <laughs> thrashed myself with uh, intervals or whatnot. But now I realize how important that is, you know, and I think early on, again, I wanted the speed. I wanted the pace. I wanted to know that every run was going to be slightly better than the last one in terms of performance, when in reality, that wasn't doing me what uh, the best uh, to get further in sport. Again, like the grit allowed me to still kind of get far, but I should have reeled myself in, had more patience, slowed down to get faster by developing a well-rounded aerobic system and anaerobic system and doing it in the right order. Um, So I definitely think that was a mistake, which eventually did catch up to me. Absolutely. It caught up to me. And now I'm, I think, you know, right now I'm, I've developed a huge base and I'm finally realizing how it's now starting to evolve into greater things. Mm -hmm. So I wish, you know, that would be the one thing. Maybe I don't wish I could go back and repeat things because, again, I think it's been a really important journey to sort of see this and learn this for myself and what I do for a living. Um, But, yeah, I think that of all, it would be having more patience and not focusing on the finish and what the numbers needed to be, just letting that evolve. Mm -hmm. That's definitely something uh, you were talking earlier about, you know, mistakes a lot of people have to make for themselves. And I always think when it comes to that, that is something we have to learn for ourselves. You know, as much as we can, I know Runners Connect has put out a ton of articles on how easy running is really what makes the difference and not running it hard, but like by taking it way easier than you think you need to, that's what actually is going to make you improve. Um, and we do also have an interview with uh, Dr. Maffetone, which I'll put oh, cool. in the show notes at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC95. But um, what I was going to say is, I think, you know, that I wonder if that's something it you just, it's so goes against what you think is logical, um, that you can't, most, most of us just can't accept it. And until we actually have done it ourselves and seen the difference. So I wonder if that is one of those things you have to just make that mistake, and then you learn from it yourself. Yeah, it's funny. And when I first started getting really heavy into all this stuff, too, it was around a time when blogging was really, really catching on in the endurance world. And a lot of people like it'd be this thing where at the end of the year, everyone would be post these blog posts on uh, how many miles they did over the year. Mm -hmm. And I got really wrapped up in that, too. And a lot of my friends were aspiring and or professionals uh, in the triathlon world or even running. 
And so I'd see their numbers and I'd be like, well, I got to do that too. So again, it was one of those things where I was letting other people's uh, journeys sort of influence mine when they probably shouldn't have been at the time. Um, so I, I really, at this point too, I try to guide people in a way where they don't get too wrapped up in what other people are doing. And that's one of the reasons too, I'm a huge fan of training by time and not by miles and also training a lot by heart rate and or no data versus always having pace staring back at you in the face. Because sometimes Mm -hmm. while these can be positive things in the overall growth, they can also be very negative feedbacks because we start to worry that oh, numbers yeah. aren't where they should be or that we're not doing enough. And, you know, runners are a lot still think more is more like we need more to get better. Running more means getting faster. Right. And mm-hmm. no, it doesn't. So sometimes we want to take away some of these feedback systems and just let the runner sort of evolve naturally um, and not get so obsessed with their friends on social media are talking about doing and the mileage they put in. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And um, actually, uh, funny enough, my uh, my Garmin, my GPS watch uh, broke about um, maybe a month ago now. And um, I, I'm, I do intend on getting another one. But uh, for the time being, I've had to do everything by time, including nice, my workouts. Huh? And yeah, at first I was like, oh, this is I don't like it. I don't know how fast I'm running. And it, I didn't care on the easy days. I've always been well, not always. But since I learned the lesson, I've been good at um, keeping my easy days easy, but it was more in workout days that it bothered me at first. But now I kind of feel very at peace knowing that I'm going by effort. And as long as I'm running as hard as I can run on that day for the conditions I have, that's all I can ask. And at, at the end of the day, you'll find out what fitness you're in when you go to the race. And that is what matters. So I'm glad you brought that up because I think that's so important and, you know, it's so easy for us as runners as those type a people to want to keep looking at the numbers and the data and we love the data you know um so don't get me wrong i love the data but you know i also love to analyze my own athletes data all the time so sometimes Mm -hmm. that leaves me i'm self-coached now um it kind of just leaves me to be a little bit more free free flowing with it (laughs) yeah definitely so then what about um with all these different races and you know training and you said you know you just kind of took to it uh immediately what is it about racing that just you know melts your heart that you love oh I'm a competitor I (laughs) you know you get me to even play a board game and I'm gonna compete (laughs) you know like that's just it's my nature and I'm actually right now uh I'm having a lot of experiences where I'm reflecting on my past and working on a book that I'll hopefully be publishing within a year or so I hope um because I have a I have a lot that's happened that I want to share with the world that I think can be helpful or at least maybe interesting to some people. I don't know, even if it's just my mom. (laughs) Um, But I I see that I've always been a competitor. I've been this way since day one. And I'm also the type of person where, you know, I know you want to talk even a little stuff about like criticism and stuff. Criticism, even if it's harsh and like has made me cry, like it'll motivate me more than anything. So when I see something um, that's within my reach and I put my mind to it, it's not easy for me to waver or uh, give up on that. And, you know, it's also been a detriment of mine because sometimes I've tended, uh, I will tend to go too hard with things, mm-hmm. which, you know, I've learned lessons there for sure. Yeah. But yeah, I think just by nature, um, I'm a competitive person and I'm able to really kind of, uh, put myself through the discipline, but, you know, going back to what we we're talking about with like the sleep stuff though, that's where I also have to check in and, you know, it's great to be competitive and a go-getter and have a lot of grit and determination, but you also have to balance that out with the ability to sort of just be like mindful and present with things and not let your competitive nature overwhelm you with, you know, all of the things. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I recently read a book over the winter break, Living with a Seal, and it's about this guy who is like, you know, fancy schmancy apartment in New York. And he hires a Navy SEAL to come live with him for a month to really whip him into shape and show him what that lifestyle is all about. And I liked it because the SEAL was extremely competitive and gritty, but also a very simple, just kind of peaceful guy. Didn't have, didn't have a lot of material items. Also um, was just able to kind of be present and uh, engaged in what that moment entailed. And I think that's really kind of what can bring a competitor to their prime Mm -hmm. is when they're also relatively relaxed and simple in the process and not 
overwhelmed and in this highly sympathetic, stressed out flight or fight state all the time. Mm -hmm. So then with with that, when you're talking about, you know, trying to stay out of that state, um, when it comes, I'm sure a lot of people when they were thinking about that, their their mind bounced to uh, pre-race nerves and how, you Mm. know, that can really... You know, a lot of people get themselves in such a state so that when they go off, you know, they're like shaking with nerves. How how have you found it helpful to calm yourself on race day when you know you've put all that time in that you don't want to mess it up? Should I admit that I just got nervous? You like brought back all these memories. I feel like I'm about to go start a race. You know how you can like you're all of a sudden your brain is going back to those moments. And I can picture myself, you know, on the sand at triathlons being like, oh my gosh, here we go. And you know, I I don't know why I'm thinking of Vine Man 70.3. If anyone is, I I know you're mostly runners out there. And running races to me have always been way more relaxed. I think it's the swim that always used to get me really kind of ramped up about triathlon. Because when I do, like even when I qualified for the Boston Marathon this year, or last year, I guess at this point, um, I was so relaxed before the race. Uh, But triathlons, I think it was that swim is always a really daunting thing, especially because you're getting in usually cold water and it's freezing outside. And really, honestly, even the professionals I know, like no one's really ever that chill and relaxed before a race. And that's okay because we do need to sort of get in our zone and be a little worked up and amped up. And I think what is more important is to manage yourself in that week leading into a race. And that's where I think, because Really, once you hit those 48 hours before, you're probably going to be sleeping like crap, especially the night before you're going to wake up thinking, is the alarm going to go off? Is the alarm going to yeah, go off yet? Yeah. I mean, how many out you have there, of you out there have done that? Um, so it's that week leading up to the race where you really, I think, need to keep yourself in check. So I've always traditionally kind of made my schedule pretty relaxed on those weeks, made sure all the grocery shopping is done. You know, all, my bike has been taken into the shop and everything's kind of taken care of. And yes, things still go wrong. And yes, you're finding yourself running around when you shouldn't be at the last moment. Um, I mean, I have a million stories of things that have gone wrong, even a, from a professional's standpoint. But you just have to also understand how to like shut it down mm-hmm. and relax. And usually what works for me is surrounding myself by other people. Okay. Um family, friends, loved ones and whatnot, and just starting to talk about things that have nothing to do with the race that's coming up. I think that's very good advice. And, you know, especially uh, people who don't, who aren't interested in it. I find it's nice to be around people who don't understand, even if they ask you kind of stupid questions that don't really make any sense, at least they're going to ask you that question and then move on because they don't really care that much about yeah. you know sports so i think i think that's a great point to bring up totally um okay so let's completely switch gears and kind of talk about endurance planet um you know this is your business and i'd love for you to share with the readers and listeners about um what exactly it is and uh how it's kind of grown over the years so endurance planet i love this thing so much and i have to say it was not my own creation i gotta give credit to kevin patrick it was back in about 2006 that this podcast came to be and it's cool because it now makes uh for one of the longest standing endurance podcasts that is in existence if not the oldest podcast out there there might be a couple other in this uh, genre um and it was around way before podcasting was even a thing i mean it just in the last couple of years has podcasting really come into its prime where mm-hmm. people are downloading everything from, you know, the serial series to these kinds of shows to everything in between. Um, and so I was approached by a friend of mine, Ben Greenfield, who also has a really phenomenal podcast, yep. the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Um, we met when we were both working for uh, another website, everymantry.com, over at Kona for the Ironman World Championships. We met back in 2010, I believe it was. And that fall slash winter, he approached me with this idea that he wanted me to be the host of Endurance Planet. He had actually come into uh, the show as the owner, as Kevin Patrick, the original owner, decided to go on to other business adventures and whatnot in his career. And so Ben wanted me to come on as the host. And I was like, heck, yeah, (laughs) let's do it. It kind of felt like it aligned with the journalism education I had. Although I will say I was a print journalism person, not a broadcast. So once I started with Endurance Planet in 2011, I was, oh, it was ugly. Let's just, (laughs) I was completely humbled by how difficult it was. And Tina, I'm sure you can understand how that is to find your voice on a show. 
when you're talking into a microphone, staring at a computer and it's completely <laughs> awkward. Yeah. Um, so that took a while. Uh, it took a while to find my voice, but thankfully I was surrounded by amazing co-hosts and guests and topics. And, um, you know, in the beginning people were like, what happened to Kevin Patrick and who is this Valley girl who's taken <laughs> over even though I'm, you know, and I'm like, wait, I'm actually smart. I have something to say. And so I got a lot of criticism in the beginning. And like I said earlier about stuff like that, it really like it, it definitely stuck with me, but it also more than anything motivated me. It was like, I'm not going to let you guys like bring me down. I'm going to keep going for this. And, you know, so now it's, we're moving on into um, the fifth year or so. And the podcast is thriving. It's huge. And it's great because we have this great following who aren't just tuning in to get entertained, to get educated, just like you guys are doing with your podcast and website. And it's phenomenal. I love that these communities are growing. And I really try to uh, angle, I actually have taken over as owner from, of Endurance Planet and that took place um, a couple of years ago. So then, uh, you know, Ben, again, his podcast is incredibly successful. And we had a conversation and realized that it was time, you know, I, I was basically doing everything for Endurance Planet. We mm -hmm. realized, um, you know what, this should be mine. So um, I was very, very lucky to become owner of Endurance Planet a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, I'm re we're really the podcast. It's not just me, but how it's things have evolved in general. We're, we're all about optimizing health and performance. So it's not just a performance angle of things. It's optimizing health as well. And, you know, you, you start to dive into this endurance stuff, more running trap on our, all of the above. And you realize a lot of people are willing to put themselves out there, but at the sacrifice of maintaining good health. Mm -hmm. And we want to be a voice where you can get both. You can have the best of both worlds. And people will be like, yeah, right. That's not possible. It's not possible to be healthy and do a sub three marathon or something like that. But we're here to say that it absolutely is. It just takes diligence and work on your end. And we're going to be your source on how to make sure that takes place and educate and empower you. No, I think that's great. And um, I, I mean, what about what a mentor to have with uh, Ben Greenfield? That's pretty, that's pretty cool um, that you, you know, had him to talk to and kind of bounce ideas off um, and his podcast great. is yeah. huge and, you know, very popular with um, all the different kinds of guests he has on the show. So what kind of people do you interview mostly for Endurance Planet? Do you want to give us some examples of topics you've gone into? Well, we have uh, our regular rotating shows for sure. And like I've already mentioned, um, Lucho, Tim Wagner, and he and I, our, our show Ask the Coaches is probably the premier show. Uh, we, I think it's because of him. I'm not going to take credit for it. Everyone, <laughs> everybody loves him some Lucho. Um, and we go through your listeners' questions. So if you want to have your question answered on anything related, I mean, at this point, it's even revolving into what books did you read? Like, what books would you recommend? Like, stuff that's not even related to sport, but I guess in a way it could be. <laughs> um, and then we have Ben on for Sports Nutrition Talk. We have Dr. Phil Maffetone on as a regular host. And, you know, Phil's really our voice of reason and how we need to focus on our health and achieve balance in a lot of ways. And there's so many places we go with him. We talk a lot about fat burning and developing your metabolic efficiency, things of that nature. Um, and everything in between, I, uh, you know, we have a lot of professional athletes on, we've had a lot of professional athletes on over the years, runners, uh, and triathletes mostly, and, um, also health experts. And that's evolving to include all kinds of health experts. We have a lot. I'm also big into strength training. I know you wanted to maybe even talk about some cross training stuff. Yeah. So, I'll, um, you know, my other passion with my athletes and just now before I got on the phone with you, I'm going through videos that my athletes send me to critique their, you know, strength training, functional mm -hmm. training kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So I have on guests like Kelly Starrett and people who, um, uh, people like that who are really just like at the top of their craft and knowledgeable, like none other, um, to give advice. And, it just, the list goes on and on and on. I mean, I'm taught, we're talking about two to three shows a week okay. for years now. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. And, and so, yeah, let's talk about strength training for just a, just a minute. You said, uh, you know, it's a big part of your training and, uh, how important would you say cross training and using the different methods of, um, you know, you've got biking, swimming, strength training, all kinds of things. Do you think that's played a big part in how successful you've been able to be? Yeah. So the strength training to begin with is huge. I, I definitely like a lot of runners, you know, that idea of like 
um, maybe lacking a little patience in the beginning because you get so excited about wanting to achieve things in the race that you've signed up for. Mm -hmm. You sort of put the cart before the horse and Mm -hmm. I did the same thing, you know, and early on, um, I was getting just random injuries that we all get it band syndrome, you know, runner's knee, uh, whatever under the sun. Like I had it. Um, maybe not that many, but, (laughs) um, and then as you know, as soon as I started on a regular strength training routine that included both functional stuff and weights, I mean, that was my ticket to keeping a robust body that, yeah, it's things would I'd get the little niggles every now and then, but nothing crazy. Um, and also I think, you know, for endurance athletes, especially the female endurance athletes, like the whole idea of promoting strong bone density you know, yes, running is technically a weight bearing exercise as opposed to swimming and cycling because of the way gravity is working on you. But it's not quite enough, especially if a lot of people out there are susceptible to things like the um, female athlete triad syndrome. And it's not just girls, the guys are just as vulnerable to this. Mm -hmm. It's just girls usually suffer more um, easily measurable uh, consequences. But, you know, this whole idea of keeping good bone density, you can really, really do a lot of good stuff for your body just by putting a barbell on your back. It doesn't Mm -hmm. have to be the heaviest barbell, (laughs) you know. Um, And so that's, I think, really important. I can tell a lot about how an athlete is going to perform simply on what their overhead squat looks like. And that that's, again, like when I'm working with athletes, those are some of the first things I look at to see like, okay, where are your strengths and weaknesses and how can we evolve? Yeah. And I see a lot of crossover and what I see in the functional stuff to then what I'm seeing when I see, uh, do my video run analyses of athletes. I, I even talked to an athlete in length about this last night and it's where we can really focus in on developing good biomechanics and whatnot is in the gym actually, where we have the time to like, be a little bit slower and methodical about things and then develop good positive habits in our bodies that then transfer over into your racing and your running. Running is very easy to do because you just go out and you put one foot in front of the other, but it's not easy to do well. Yeah. So that's why the strength training I think is crucial. As for the other cross training, um, you know, at at first for me, it was, uh, all swim, bike, run, because what else do you have time for? Um, (laughs) But as it's evolved and, you know, in the last couple of years, I've really, your listeners will love this. I'm just really focusing on running. Like I've I've found a new love for just running. I'm Mm -hmm. starting to get ultras too, but I can't just be running all the time. So I've found other ways to evolve as a, what I like to deem being fit for life now, stand up paddle boarding. Great runners. I mean, I will go out and do 10 K on the paddleboard in the ocean. And you want something that's humbling, go do that, especially <laughs> on a choppy day. Um, and you can develop badass stability and strength and overall body awareness on a paddleboard. Mm-hmm. Um, and even things like backpacking, put a load on your back and go hike at altitude. And I think you're going to be a better marathoner because of that. Yeah. So, you know, the, the mental training- strength too. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so lots, lots of cool things that you can evolve uh, and incorporate into a routine that really actually they may not seem like they make sense in a marathon training program, but at the end of the day, they do. And they also promote longevity. Yeah, definitely. Although I think uh, if paddleboarding is that good, I think I might come live with you so I can uh, do paddleboarding to strengthen myself because that sounds pretty damn good. But uh, I, I can't see myself doing it. <laughs> I always keep an open invite for people. Oh yeah, to come down. that'd be nice. I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, most of our listeners are um, wishing that they lived uh, in the wonderful uh, Southern California that you do, but um, there are other, other options. <laughs> and, there uh, are. Yeah. You know, sometimes I wish I lived in the creative. snow and the mountains off the grid. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I guess that's true. And uh, you know, each place has their own your, their own positives and negatives. So just go out and give some other things a try, even if it's just group classes at your local gym. Some days we need all the motivation we can get to make sure we finish our workout or make it through that cross training session, especially when we're trapped indoors. It has been well documented that running with music or a motivating podcast can help improve performance. But as much as I love the idea, I found myself getting frustrated with the cords getting in my way or when they would rip out of the treadmill. Finally, I have a solution. Jabra Pulse is the sweat proof, weather proof, wireless sports earbud that is perfect for runners of all levels and speeds. Even better, it has an accurate in-ear heart rate monitor that quickly connects to your phone so you can ditch the chest strap. The earbuds will have a secure and comfortable fit thanks to the ability to customize the earpieces. 
Runners Connect listeners can get exclusive offers and enter to win a free Jabra Pulse headset by signing up at jabra.com forward slash runners connect. That's J A B R A dot com forward slash runners connect to start your journey or buy the Jabra Pulse at your local Best Buy. Jabra, this is where it starts. Um, okay, so just uh, I just want to go back to podcast just briefly, but um, you know, as that is the focus of what Endurance Planet is doing. Um, but what is it about podcasts that you think are so great for endurance athletes to listen to? Is there a reason why? I think a lot of podcasters this day and age, I mean, you can get pretty much a college level education without the price tag <laughs> at the, and or entertainment without having to pay a cable bill. You know, I mean, there is just so many great podcasts out there. And I know, you know, people often ask me what I listen to and how I go about it. Am I listening to podcasts when I'm out running? And it really honestly depends. And it the it's depends thing is sort of our inside joke on our podcast, too, because so much of it depends on the situation, right? So <laughs> Um, there are days where I want zero. I want nothing. I want no noise. I just want to hear the sound of my feet um, pitter pattering against the trail or whatever. There are other days where I just want to dive into the most nitty gritty scientific health, functional health podcast and just learn like I'm sitting in a classroom mm-hmm. taking notes. And there's other days where I want crazy entertainment with slapstick humor you know, and it, you just kind of got to like think about what mood you're in and go mm-hmm. with it and not force things. And I think that also really, really relates to how a lot of training should be, too, as, it, as you develop, you know, sort of an intuitive nature about what your body's asking for. Um, but I just I love this world that podcasts uh, open us to because it can be a little bit of everything. And I just I think most of all, I like that podcasts can be so educational and informative. And it's much better than tuning in to the radio and hearing just pointless stuff. Like I, I really just like, I don't, we don't have cable. Um, my fiance and I don't have TV. Like we'll watch movies and stuff, um, and documentaries and whatnot, but we don't have TV. We haven't for years. I don't listen to the radio other than a local station. Um, it's all about podcasts yeah. or, or silence. Yeah, no, I, I'm pretty much in the same boat. Actually. I like to listen to some podcasts, but then some days just be quiet and yeah, we don't have cable either. So it is kind of nice, and um, yeah. Although I have to say, one day I decided um, I was going to listen to a business podcast while I was doing a long run, and I had a three-hour long run, and mm. I put these business podcasts on. But with about an hour to go, my brain was so fried from the run <laughs> and listening to like this educational podcast that I just, I just, I had to put on Disney music because I just needed something light. That was gonna just be like silly and get me through that last hour because I was just so done. So I That's think so. Yeah, I can <laughs> totally relate to that. There are times like I'm really big into my functional health podcast and all that kind of stuff where they're talking about like medical level stuff. And you're right. I I'll sort of hit the wall and I'll be like, all right, back to iTunes because <laughs> no more podcasts. <laughs> yeah. And then my fiance, he's also a brewer. He uh, brews beer. So oh, he, cool. So when we're on our road trips or driving somewhere, he's always like turning on the beer podcast. And I don't <laughs> drink beer anymore. Um, but they're always kind of funny and fascinating to the point where I'm like, okay, I've heard enough about the beer. I don't need the beer <laughs> talk. <laughs> but that's the but, cool thing that there's so many varieties that the right? fact that there is a beer podcast is pretty Oh, cool. there's multiple. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, that's good to know. So many. <laughs> I'm sure we've got a lot of listeners. Uh, runners love their beer, so check. Yeah. you can check some of them out. Um, okay, so just uh, one more thing I wanted to ask you about was um, you you mentioned earlier just briefly about your, your own blog and how you'd you know, written about some of your experiences and I was just wondering when it comes to your your blog do you tend to have specific topics that you think people would want to learn about or is it just whatever comes into your head that day really funny you asked that because I the last few blogs I've posted people are probably like what the heck is Tawny talking about these (laughs) days um I started my blog in 2008 and up until about I don't know 2013 it was pretty much all about triathlon all the time race reports training everything I was doing in that aspect of my life, um, probably a little bit of personal stuff, you know, school, whatnot. Um, but as it's evolved, because, you know, I, if you go back into some of my archives, you'll see that around 2013 is when I sort of tanked, kind of hit the wall, if you will. And it's, since then, it's been a rebuilding process. And my my passion has evolved to not only include sport and performance and whatnot, but also health. And, you know, again, that relates much into what we do on Endurance Planet. 
so I'm, I've really evolved the writing on the blog to share about my journey to optimizing health. And um, mm -hmm. it's evolving less into talking just about the racing I'm doing and more into these, what I at least think are really interesting articles on how people can kind of build together a, a good bill of health while they're trying to be an athlete or just, you know, well-functioning human mm -hmm. and looking at it from, you know, again, that functional health model, not the traditional Western model. Um, and I'm really enjoying it. You know, I just posted a blog, uh, based on a podcast we did recently. It was talking more about a uh, low carb, high fat versus ketogenic diets and don't mistake the two. And here's my experience. Um, you know, also kind of talking in, about more personal stuff. You know, I, there was a lot of, there was years where I was afraid still of so, certain criticism. So I'd shy away from certain topics, but I've kind of, as I've grown up and stuff, just realized I don't really care anymore because <laughs> this stuff's important. And, you know, people are going to hate. They're always going to be the haters talking on a forum about something, whatever. Um, but I got something to share and something to say, and I'm not going to hold back anymore. So I've gotten really way, way more personal about that stuff in my life. Um, not just tailoring my blog post to this pretty little race report. Mm -hmm. And it's really kind of growing there too. So that's fun and exciting. So hopefully, hopefully that evolves even more because I like, I, I, I love writing about the stuff I'm writing about right now. And you know, as I mentioned, at, at heart, I still am very much a writer from my journalism background. Yeah, no, that's great. And I mean, it just shows that, you know, even though you said you kind of moved away from, um, you know, what you essentially what you sh thought you should be writing about and kind of more what you wanted to write about and, and people have responded well to that. So it is, you know, a testament to you that um, what you people do want to hear what you want to say. So that's kind of cool to hear about. Um, I just have a few more little quick questions um, for yeah. our final kick round, which uh, I'm just going to ask you five questions. So just kind of a brief answer, just so our listeners can learn a little more about you um, and your life, I guess. So what is the greatest advice you've ever received? Ah, <laughs> wow. Tough one. <laughs> um, ooh, I think, you know, gosh, I could go a million different places with that. Like For athletes, the whole idea of patience and slowing down to get fast, things like that are great. I think just focus on you, your process, your journey, and don't worry about what everyone else is out there doing mm -hmm. or what everyone else may or not be thinking about you. Just focus on you. Believe in yourself. Um, that's, a, that's a big one for yep. sure. And, and I think sometimes it takes a little time to own that. Mm -hmm. So go Definitely. for it. Great. Good advice there. Uh, what is your favorite running book or blog? This might be tough running book or blog well i gotta go to my guys like phil mathetone and <laughs> yep. the one the books that i've gone to to help me evolve my own philosophies over time um so you know all of phil mathetone's books are great uh the his latest the endurance handbook i actually was able to write the forward for that one oh, cool. so that's a good one for sure um running books though, i mean heck i would even say the one i just read recently living with a seal it's technically about running and there's a lot of little teeny itty bitty life lessons in there that are great mm -hmm. um but goodness gracious I love reading and I can't even think of all the great books <laughs> well, <laughs> you've given us right you've given us two there and uh oh, I guess a whole group of them and another one so technically you're actually cheating anyway so I'm not gonna let you have <laughs> it anymore <laughs> um okay so what would you tell what would your best advice be to a new runner work on your mobility and your stability and don't even worry about how many miles you need to put in per week just build that foundation oh I love like, that easy, easy. build really the foundation good. first really good I love that great uh favorite running product um oh this is another <laughs> feel like I, I, I although I like to be minimalist there's a couple things that come to mind first and foremost my life proof case because without it I'd mm. probably be on my 10th phone after dropping phone so many times so you take a phone every every time you run or bike pretty much because okay. I have and so set, part two of that would be my hydration pack okay. and I just got a new Nathan one and it kicks butt I love it so much um I also have a camelback one both for running and I I really I take my phone because you never know what's going to happen out there yeah granted sometimes mostly it's because I'm listening to something but I always like to have that little emergency outlet mm -hmm. if you will nope that's and good yeah, keeping it in the life proof case is golden. <laughs> Very helpful there. And I'm sure a lot of people are actually looking for something like that for when they're running. I don't run with a 
uh, phone most of the time, so that doesn't uh, apply to me as much, but I, I know most people do actually run with the phone. Um, where do you live again? Where do I live? Kentucky. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Kentucky, yeah. I mean, I think part of it here, around here, I mean, not to be um, make, instill fear, but you just, you know, you always want to feel like you have a little bit of that. <laughs> yeah, that uh, makes sense. If there is an emergency, you have some way to connect <laughs> with someone. <laughs> no, that's very important. And I have been told multiple times I should take a phone, but I'm just too stubborn right now. So I'll probably, I'll probably cave soon. <laughs> um, and finally, your favorite expert to look to for advice. Um, I think we may know the answer here. Right. I mean, I've had a lot of great mentors at this point, so I feel really grateful. Um, but, you know, guys like Lucho, Phil Maffetone, and even the owner of my gym, who was the guy who first let me step a foot in a gym and kind of show me what it was all about. <laughs> so those three guys and then actually my fiance, too. Yeah, you great. have to mention he's, him. Though. <laughs> yeah, he's taught me a lot about the balance side. of oh, things. And that's very, very important, as we've kind of discussed today. OK, Tony, well, this was a great interview and I really appreciate your time that you've taken to talk to me today and kind of give us some insight into behind the scenes of you rather than you being the one interviewing. So this is great. And uh, thank you so much. Yeah, Tina, always a pleasure to be on the other side of things. And thank you to your audience, all you guys at Runners Connect for uh, taking the time to listen. It's been a blast. Right. Really appreciate we'll, it. We'll have some good links on the show notes of Endurance Planet and hopefully you have a lot of new listeners to check it out. Ooh. <laughs> Okay, well, I can certainly see what all the fuss is about. And uh, if you haven't already checked out Endurance Planet, you definitely should because she's just awesome and so bubbly and fun. And I hope that came across today. If you did enjoy today's podcast, I would really love if you could subscribe, which you can do by visiting our brand new podcast page, which you can find at runnersconnect.net forward slash run to the top. We've got loads of great resources for you there and hopefully it's really helpful for you. Uh, next week I'm going to be talking to Trent Morrow who is the world record holder for the most marathons run in seven continents in one year he's also known as Marathon Man and it's a really exciting and interesting interview and I'm sure you're going to really enjoy it especially those of you who wanted more kind of everyday runners even though he's done something extraordinary it's very uh, easy to understand and you could kind of see yourself doing it so until next time have a great week